Hello everyone, we're continuing the third anniversary celebrations today with another entry into my series of cool and affordable cars for young driving enthusiasts. And this car is a modern version of a true British icon. It's the R53 Mini Cooper S John Cooper Works. Now I started this series as essentially Fiesta ST alternatives and a large number of the cars in the series so far have been cars that are in many ways totally different to the little Ford. Uh, this is one which is perhaps the most similar in its price and its aim. Now, in truth, the Mini, when it came out, was actually considerably more expensive than a Fiesta. At the era of this Mini, it would have been going up against things like the old 6th generation Fiesta ST. So you've got things like the ST150 and so on, and these were not cheap cars at all. The BMW Mini is one of those cars I just hate to love. So much about it is just everything that I moan about on a near daily basis with cars. The whole faux retro inspired styling, the over the top marketing, the fact that they are basically everywhere. However, I simply cannot argue with the fact that they are a massive hoot to drive. I have yet to drive the current generation F chassis car, but I have got some seat time in the second generation car, and if you want to know my opinion on one of those, I suggest you check out my video on the lesser spotted Mini Club van, which was a most entertaining car to review. Now this first generation Mini, I've got a little bit of seat time in another example, and these bear the chassis codes of R50 to R53, with the later ones being R56s and all that sort of stuff. Not a mini expert, so please don't quote me on any of that stuff. Now, the last one of these that I drove was a basic Mini 1, which is the regular, ordinary car with about 130 horsepower. This John Cooper Works is an interesting car because it is actually a genuine example of an official aftermarket tuner car. Nowadays, you can just go to any Mini dealership and order a John Cooper Works Mini, and you've been able to do that for a number of years. However, when this came out, you couldn't do that. What you had to do was go to your Mini dealer and buy a Mini Cooper S, and then specify the John Cooper Works tuning pack, which was a no doubt very expensive add-on that the dealer would fit to your car. Now, this was no simple remap. The John Cooper Works pack actually involved quite a bit so for this particular car, you had reworked heads, which have been gas flowed and ported, and, and that kind of stuff isn't cheap and easy to do. You've got an 11% smaller supercharger pulley, meaning that the supercharger is pulling just that little bit harder and faster. You've got a different exhaust. You've got spark plugs, which apparently are a little bit colder, and you have a remapped ECU to take advantage of all of that work. Now the net result was a car that produced about 200 horsepower rather than the standard 160 odd. This one is a later John Cooper Works and on top of all of that you got a reworked intake system, bigger 380cc injectors and a different map to give you about 210 horsepower. So that's quite a bit for a car that's not all that big. Now it's not a flyweight, if you're expecting one of these to weigh the same as the old Rover or Austin Minis, you are of course going to be disappointed. These tip the scales at about 1200 kilos. Now this car's owner Sam has come from an MX-5 and those are a little bit lighter but of course much older and much less practical and that is basically the reason that he's gone for one of these. First generation Mini Cooper S and above have this lovely supercharged setup which make a delicious noise and of course give you all the benefits that you'd have of having a supercharged car. Later cars, the R56 and onwards, have a turbo setup, which of course is much easier to get bigger power out of and is probably more tuner friendly, but there's something I really quite like about supercharged cars, and for the kind of roads that I'm about to drive this car on, they do work really well. Now, if you're currently in the market for one of these, they are generally quite robust, but you need to make sure that they have been well looked after, they have been quite serviced, and I'd probably budget a little bit of money just to keep on top of things. 
Um, examples of engines failing aren't uncommon, but they're not common enough for me to really have any concern about. And superchargers can potentially need reconditioning once they pass the 100,000 mile mark, although that's absolutely no guarantee that they are going to fail. There's plenty of these out there that have done far more miles and are absolutely fine. You'll of course find plenty of buyer's guides for these online and the good news is that because they made so many of them, spare parts are fairly easy to get. Now perhaps the biggest negative of this first generation car is the fact that the interiors just aren't as well made as the later ones. The R56 is a huge step up in interior quality and while this one is still certainly pretty well put together, there's a few bits of trim that are a little bit loose, a few things don't fit quite great, it's not really squeaking or rattling or anything like that, but it certainly doesn't feel anywhere near as premium as the second generation car, which really does feel like a slightly smaller BMW. However, if you're looking at buying one of these, certainly now, a premium interior is probably not particularly high on your priorities list. What you're more interested in is how the car drives. Now this is a mini road. In typical supercharged fashion, the car does not give you that big instant torque hit that you'd get from a turbo car. Instead, it's just linear, progressive and building power. Now, you wouldn't really say that it feels like a 200 horsepower car, but it certainly moves nicely enough. Now, on top of the standard JCW specification, this car's got a couple of minor upgrades. It's had the wiper deleted, which is a pretty standard scene thing, and it's also got some AP coilovers on it, which actually ride pretty well. The car turns in really keenly and nicely, like you would expect a Mini to, and it moves down this road really well. makes actually a really nice sound, it's pretty well judged, it's not stupidly loud, you get a little bit of supercharger whine and you can make really good progress. You're not doing silly speeds but you can interact with it nicely. Helium towing is great, the gear shift in this is pretty good. Now the owner doesn't like the fact that the clutch is a little on the heavy side but in fairness it's pretty typical BMW of this era, that's kind of what they were like. The same goes for the steering, it's a little heavy and it's not the best for feedback but the car responds and turns in so wonderfully. One of my bugbears with the current generation Mini is they have this silly marketing campaign where they say that the cars have maximum go-kart feel. And I'm like, yes, they do feel great, they're fun, but I mean, they don't actually quite handle like go-karts because they've got the engine in the wrong place compared to what a go-kart does. And the thing about cars that handle so great and have a reputation for fun handling, is you don't need to tell everyone. It's, it's sort of like the Aston Martin Power Beauty Soul thing. Like if you, if you have to tell people that that's what a car has, it doesn't really have it. But this is an awful lot of fun. And of course, it's perfectly sized for making your way down a little road like this. Now storage space isn't the best of course, the boot is as you'd expect pretty tiny, although it does have a 12 volt socket in it which is actually kind of surprising and nice to see, it gives the car a little edge of practicality. doesn't respond brilliantly to your initial press but once you put your foot down it, it does actually do what you ask it to. And this is just what you want it to be, that back end can be a little lively. Now the car at slightly lower speeds can kind of pogo a little bit and that's no doubt going to be a combination of the aftermarket suspension and the fact that it's just a very short wheelbase car. But it gets around these corners brilliantly. Now some minis of this generation will have a limited slip diff as standard, some will not, some will have had them added afterwards, so you'll have to check with each particular car as to whether it does or doesn't, but if you're into your performance driving I would highly recommend fitting one because it does make a fairly big difference. When you consider that you can pick up one of these for, oof, now a few thousand pounds, you can pick up an example for three to four grand and a really tidy one is about maybe five or six, if that. And they provide a huge amount of driving involvement and fun for relatively little outlay. And the great thing with minis is they have an enormous scene behind them. So you've got all the mini owners clubs and groups and they are generally quite nice, supportive and friendly people. I've known a few of them in the past. 
you've got plenty of support if you want to modify or upgrade your car because there's so many bits to do that you've got all sorts of ways of repairing your car on the cheap as well because they made so many which means there's going to be loads in breakers yards especially now they're getting to this age and they generally don't seem to have too many fatal flaws and even big flaws like the fact that the cylinder heads can apparently crack are not even that bad because you can get a reconditioned john cooper works one for less than 500 quid and for a major part like that that's not too bad so all round this is actually a pretty damn good car. Now other downsides if you're looking at running one on the cheap as a young driving enthusiast is the fact that the fuel economy in these is abysmal. Now when I had my first proper BMW I had an E46 330ci Club Sport, a car that I still to this day dearly love. And my sister and her then boyfriend and now husband bought a Mini Cooper S convertible of this generation in electric blue. Stunning looking car, really actually quite liked it. However, I got better fuel economy out of a 3 litre 6 cylinder BMW than they did out of the 1.6 litre Mini. So you should bear that in mind if you intend on in putting serious miles on your car. Now they did do of course diesel versions of this Mini but they're just not going to be anywhere near as much fun to hoon along as this is. And if you want a diesel car, I'd probably suggest looking at one of the later R56s. I kind of can't help but like this car. I was even slightly worried that the AP coilovers might ruin it because when you see things like that on cheap performance cars that they generally just tend to be a bit awful and horrible and actually they're not at all so it's cool it's not a pristine car but it's a car that is used and enjoyed and from my perspective that is all what being a young petrol head is all about so my thanks to sam for bringing it down my thanks to you guys for watching please like comment below and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already because this month we are trying to hit 40k and we are very close so, we'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.